Okay, and so I'm now recording if, if I hope this is okay. So uh, this is my great pleasure to introduce you the distinguished speaker, Professor Clarence De Silva is a fellow of IEEE, Canadian Academy of Engineering and Royal Society of Canada. He received the higher doctorate this year from University of Cambridge, UK and from Massachusetts Institute of Technology is in 1978 and University of Cambridge in 1998 and an honorary DH degree from University of Waterloo, uh, Canada in 2008. Uh, he has been a professor of mechanical engineering and senior Canada research chair and NCERT BC Packers chair in industrial road automation at the University of British Columbia, Vancouver, uh, Canada since 1988. He has authored 25 books and over 570 papers, half of which are in journals. His recent books published in Taylor and Francis CRC are Modeling of Dynamic Systems with Engineering Applications 2018, Sensor Systems 2017, Sensors and Actuators in yeah. System yeah. Instrumentation, Second Edition 2016, Mechatronic, Mechanics of Material 2014, Mechatronics a Foundation Course 2010, Modeling and Control of Engineering System 2009, Vibration Fundamental Practice, second edition, 2007, uh, by Addison Wesley. Soft Computing and Intelligent System Design, Theory, Tools, and Application, with F. Carey, 2004, and by Springer, Force and Position Control of Mechatronic Systems Design and Application in Medical de Devices, with Lee and Leon. So it's really my great pleasure to invite you to listen to this distinguished talk. Thank you, Professor De Silva. Uh, th thank you, Professor Koshnaud. So uh, I am humbled and honored by your very generous and long introduction. Thank you, and also good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. I see that we have a huge audience. So I will uh, try to do justice to all of you, and I will try to make it not very technical because I know that there is a diverse audience uh, this afternoon. So uh, let me actually share my screen and go to my PowerPoint. So I hope everybody can see my PowerPoint and I'm going to go to the presentation mode. And I'm going to select the laser pointer. So I have the laser pointer. So as Professor Koshnaud uh, uh, announced, this is our topic today. I want to thank Professor Koshnaud for inviting me. When he asked me, I could not say no for two main reasons. Number one, he's a good friend. Our association goes long back in many different places in the world. And number two, mechatronics is in my heart. It's a very uh, interesting subject, important subject for me. So for both fronts, I couldn't <laughs> say no. Yeah. So let me start. So this is the plan of our talk, we are, I'm going to talk about the origin of this term actually and the field. And then I'm going to kind of bring in instrumentation. So some of you may question why I'm bringing something other than mechatronics and design. Uh, if you are not already familiar, you will notice that instrumentation is quite related to mechatronics and design. And so are sensors and actuators. So we, I'm going to touch upon those things. Then I'm going to kind of bring up these two together, in mechatronics and instrumentation. Then I'm going to bring up instrumentation and design together. And 
throughout, I'm going to give some examples to kind of highlight my points and highlight some of the key foci in this general area. Okay, so that's the plan. So let's look at the origin. I'm sorry, of Professor De Silva. Yeah. May, I, uh, may I request the attendees please mute themselves? Thank you. Sure. Okay. Sorry you can hear me properly, right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, thank you. Yes, that's a good point. Uh, I, I see that all the time. Sometimes I forget to mute myself. So it kind of introduces noise on the speaker. So thank you, Professor Koshnaut, for pointing that. So let me uh, start with the origin of mechatronics. It goes way back to 1915 with the Asakawa Electric in Kitaksu, Japan. So at that time, this company was producing induction motors and of course their drive unit, which is the control unit. And then after World War II, this kind of expanded into other places like United States in particular, and their induction motors became quite popular. So they realized that it's like an electromechanical problem and they faced some of the issues that we know today as mechatronic issues. So here's a, like a view of, uh, interior view of uh, the induction motor, okay? So for those who have not seen that. So they thought maybe it's time to think differently, okay? That's the starting point. Now, why induction motor? It's an actuator, first of all. So we talked about sensors and actuators. Induction mode is actuator. It's an electromechanical actuator. And it's, it has some advantages over other motors like DC motors and then stepper motors and also other actuators like hydraulic and pneumatic actuators, for example, uh, because it uses a grid, AC supply. So that's convenient. You don't need a like a separate power supply and no need of these other things. I'm not going to go into all these details, but they tend to be kind of technical. So you need to know these other motors as well to know that this motor doesn't need a commutator, whereas a DC motor needs commutator and brushes or like electronic commutation. So there are other problems like, uh, you know, safety, issues and so on, which are kind of addressed in a way by induction motors. And also very importantly, it can serve high payloads, high machinery like milling machines. They are robust and relatively easy to maintain and so on. So they uh, last long. So, those are the advantages and so they are being used and have been used in these industries, for example. Now, some of these are relatively more recent. Remember, uh, the company started producing these in early 1900s. So at that time, there was the thing that is, they were basically using two speed pole changing control. Now people who are familiar with AC motors, induction motors, early versions like an old timer like myself, we know that you have to manually start the motor. You start the motor, of course, from zero speed and gradually bring it up to the operating speed. And that is like a fixed speed. So you start from rest and you operate at a fixed speed. So that's the early version of induction motors. They use this primitive control called pole changing control. In other words, you change the, typically you double the number of poles just by mechanically changing the circuit to double the poles. So that, that has an advantage in the starting and then operating. But then we realize that if the operation is variable speed, which is the case in many applications today, that's the problem. 
And then people today developed advanced control techniques for induction motors, like variable frequency control, field vector control, and so on. But they were not available at that time. Now, importantly, look at this curve. This is like a characteristic curve of an induction motor. Now, the vertical axis is the speed. Horizontal axis is the torque. Uh, we know that both are important when you select a motor for an application, speed and torque. But the thing is, in the curve, this region of the negative slope is the stable region. That is where the motor should operate, should operate in the stable region. This is the unstable region. So when you start at zero speed, you are kind of in the unstable region. You have to kind of accelerate it to the stable region. And historically, it will operate, say, somewhere here at a constant speed. But when you do variable speed, this, is, this can be a serious issue. Suddenly, you can kind of move into an unstable region. So you have to have good controls. So those are some of the issues that this company faced. Okay, so that's what I'm summarizing here. And in particular, it's an electromechanical problem. So you can say immediately, you can say it's a mechatronic problem because many people think electromechanical is mechatronic. So we have to question that as well. So the term itself was started by the same company, Yasakawa, in 1969 by combining the two terms, mechanics and electronics, okay? And then they also registered a trademark for that name in 1972. But don't worry, it's released now. We can use the term without any problem. Otherwise, we had to get permission from the company to use the term mechatronics. But it kind of deals with primarily mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. Now there are in any engineering system, you can say you can clearly identify some components that are purely entirely mechanical, some components that are purely and entirely electrical, and some others that are that overlap, that have presence in both areas. And also remember that it's just talking about the two domains, mechanical and electrical. So we had to later on question whether that is adequate, okay? So people then immediately said, okay, mechatronics is uh, like a combination of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering. So it's this overlapping area here. And then they realized that no, we also need to bring control engineering. That is what I mentioned before with Yasakawa, the induction motor problem. And not only that, computer engineering too. So then they said, okay, this is mechatronics, the intersection of these three domains, these three sets in this uh, Venn diagram. But does that define mechatronics? Now people thought that defines mechatronics. That's why they say right away when they see electromechanical systems is a mechatronic system. And then they realized that no, we need a better definition of mechatronics. So, if you have see all these practical machinery or devices, you can say right away, I mean, you can claim that they are mechatronic devices or systems, but I am arguing that you cannot say that if you don't go further. Then we bring in this topic of instrumentation. And then with that, we bring in sensors and actuators, of course, you know, we know induction mode is an actuator, so you see the relevance there. Then how about sensors? How about instrumentation? How about other devices? So in terms of sensors, you have many different types of sensors. I'm not going to talk, uh, talk about that in detail now anyway, but I just want to say that it's relevant to our topic today, okay? So you can have sensors, to sense many different things. And then similarly, you have 
the, this topic of instrumentation, which deals not only with sensors, deals with actuators, deals with other hardware, other components, because it deals with identifying various components for a practical system. Now, those components are in the instrumenting sense are available, typically commercially available, and then integrating them into the system so that at the end the system will perform properly. So instrumentation is here the verb which is the instrumenting a system, okay? So it includes selecting sensors and actuators. Then the question is, don't we have to select other things? Of course, because sensors and actuators cannot perform by themselves. You need to bring in other things like signal conditioning, in general signal modification devices, interfacing devices, communication, and so on. And then control, of course, you have to include control too. So it's the instrumentation problem is not just a sensors and actuators problem, but it includes sensors and actuators. Now, how about design? So what is design? In a nutshell, in a simplistic term, design in, uh, includes just developing this practical system that will perform in a desired manner, performing a particular task. So to do that, you may need to instrument that system. So that's why, and include sensors and actuators. So design includes these things too. But then what is the difference between instrumentation and design? So let's talk about that further as well, okay? So these are kind of uh, extra, some details because the time restrictions and so on. I'm not going to go into detail. Now, Professor Kashnav is recording this talk and also I'm also going to share my PowerPoint. So if anybody's interested, you can ask him for a copy of my presentation. So you can read up some of the details later. But essentially, I just want to say how instrumentation is connected to sensors and actuators and to mechatronics. But remember, we didn't properly define mechatronics yet and also design, we have kind of, we have touched upon that as well. So let's look at the control problem. Let's look at a, a feedback control system that many of us are familiar with. So we have a plant, which is not necessarily like a chemical plant or anything. Plant in our sense is the thing that we want to operate, thing that we want to control so that it will perform the proper function, function correctly, okay? That is what we call the plant. So to do that in feedback control, you sense, you measure the response, then use it in feedback in the controller. Now he's a digital controller, basically a kind of a con computer in a different version of a computer or a hardware device as well. And then this controller, which is the brain, checks whether the system, the plant is operating properly based on this observation, the measurement. And then if not, you correct it, you adjust it, you actuate it properly. So when you actuate it, in control, you need control actuators. That means the actuators that perform the control actions. And there are other types of actuators which are plant actuators, so process actuators, which perform the functions of the plant, okay? So even under actuators, you can classify or identify two groups and so on. And also, when you, I said you measure the response, but that's not the only thing you measure. You may measure some of the inputs that are going into the plant. And some of those inputs may not be deliberate may not be known. For example, if you are controlling the room temperature, the outside temperature is not deliberate and also not necessarily known. But 
it's, it's common sense that if I know the temperature outside, I can control the interior conditions better. So that is called, that's another type of control, that's feed forward control. But again, you need sensing for that. So not only that, you need other things like here, signal conditioning. The signal, uh, signal that you are measuring may have to be filtered. It may have some noise. It may have to be amplified before you use it. So you need conditioning. And then because the digital controller, if the sense signal, which is most likely is analog signal, you have to kind of sample it, digitize it. So you need the analog to digital convert. So that is also an extra device, if you like. That's a signal converter. So you have signal conditioner, you have a signal converter. Both these fall into this category of signal modifier. So you have other types of modification like modulation and demodulation. There are also signal modifications, but they are not really conditioning or conversion, okay? So you can think of modification is the general area of signal processing, and then sub areas are conditioning and conversion, okay? So anyhow, the idea here is that there are many components and these have to work together. And there are things that I have not shown, for example, the power supplies. So many of these things will need power supply, typically DC supplies, okay? Not shown here. All those are important. All those have to work together. So that's a challenging problem. And the control engineers, Professor Koshnaud knows, and he's also a controls engineer, that this we are dealing with every day. Okay, so I already mentioned these things. I'm going to repeat it. Important of sensors because you measure many things. It's useful in many situations. You know, many things are obvious to us. And then we are to deal with sometimes sensor systems, meaning multiple sensors in a network setting or sensors and other hardware like signal conditioning. They are all called sensor systems and so on. That's what I'm getting at there. So there are all kinds of sensors. So I teach this course in sensors and actuators. So I show this to my students and ask them, what are the, what are the ones that you are familiar with? How do they perform? What do you know about them and so on? So maybe that's an exercise for you, maybe separately. So there are all kinds of sen sensors to sense thermofluid quantities, electric quantities, various mechanical quantities and so on. So, many sensors, there's no point in studying every sensor that is available. And also it's not possible either, but it's good to know some basic concepts of these and then how we bring in the issue of sensors in instrumentation, how we bring in the topic in mechatronics, how we bring that in, in design. That's the relevant issue here. Similarly with actuators, you, have, you can think of all different kinds of actuators, including this AC motors like induction motor. And there are other types of motors. There are hydraulic actuators, pneumatic actuators, different types of electric actuators like relays, for example. And also heaters and coolers are actuators too. Think about it. Because they also operate systems, thermal systems. So even though we don't really see it physically or immediately identify them, we have to classify heaters and coolers also in this category. Okay, all right. Then we have other components like mechanical components in particular. They are also important. Some are necessary like speed transmission devices like gears, chain and sprocket devices, belt drives, okay? And lead screw nut devices. They are all speed transmission devices. Some may be necessary. For example, instrumentation problem. Uh, one of the things you may be doing is to select a proper motor for an, for an application. So once you go there, one of the things you look at is its uh, data sheet. Uh, 
importantly, is speed versus torque curve, like the one I showed you for the induction motor. Okay, so the choice is not indefinite. Choice is not continuous. It's not a, like a continuous design problem. You have a discrete number of motors that you can select from because of various constraints. It may be the cost, it may be the availability, it may be the size and so on. So once we have a set of actuators, then you had application, what if what the available actuators don't match the load? What if the actuators that are available cannot do the function properly? Then of course you can go and do other things like try to find a different actuator from another source, which may be difficult, may be costly. You may even want to maybe extremely design a new actuator or use a gear, speed transmit. So that we typically do. Often the actuator doesn't work adequately without a gear system but it works adequately with the gear system because the gear speed, step down gears, reducing the speed also means increasing the torque. So you are essentially changing the speed torque behavior of the actuator by introducing a gear system. So the advantages, but there are some shortcomings like mechanical things are relatively slow, relatively bulky, so time delay issues and so on. And that becomes a, a challenge, increasing challenge in a mechatronic situation because you have to deal with the problems together. You have to deal with mechanical things, electrical, electronic things together. And also thermal things, other domains like heat generation in a motor is very critical. Or ele electrical hardware, electronic hardware is critical. So you have to bring in the thermal domain as well. And then if you are using hydraulic actuator or pneumatic actuator, you have to introduce that other domain, fluid domain, and so on. So now we are seeing this issue. So let me pose this problem to say that the physical engineering domain is not the limit in this kind of a situation. So think about your your ear cleaning exercise. It may be that you self clean yeah, your ear school. or you no may ask somebody to some... clean it for you for some reason. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. Can you sure. please unmute Still yourself? Okay. Yeah. Can you please? So you are so this is somebody else. Uh, can you make me the host? Can you, can you please make me the host so I can? Sorry. So if you make me the host, I can uh, mute them. So you're the host now. Am I the host? Yeah, you're oh, the host. If you sorry. make me the host, I make you just in case. Uh, okay, I, okay. Co -host. Anyhow, maybe they can self do it because I had to switch my thing, uh, sharing oh, screen. Sure, sure, no problem. That, so. Okay, I think now it's okay now. Okay, now it's good. Okay, so this problem, if you do it yourself or if somebody else does it, it's two different problems. How does it differ? You can see that here. This is self-cleaning. This is the cleaning your ear by somebody else. And this self-cleaning thing, the control is your brain, okay? And then your, your actuator is your fingers that manipulates your cotton swab. And then plant is your ear. And then what are you sensing? You can sense many different things. Number one, you feel the in your fingers, your haptic kind of feel, tactile feel, uh, what you are doing in the ear, okay? So that is like, if you like force reflection or tactile sensing, or you, it's this area of haptic teleoperation in robotics, okay? So Professor Koshner knows a lot about that area. Then you have other things. For example, you can kind of, hear the sound of cleaning by yourself. Not only that, sometimes you may do something wrong, you feel the pain and you may scream. So you feel the, uh, the pain and also you hear the screaming. 
all that goes into the brain and the brain adjusts the manipulation accordingly. So that is your problem. So now you can see it's a, like a uh, human oriented situation, but still you see sensors, actuators and controllers. Uh, and it's kind of, you can think that is also a mechatronic problem. So if you have uh, somebody else cleaning you here, then you have two brains. The person who is cleaning and you who are being clean. But the thing is, this part is similar to here. Okay, you know, this feedback and so on. But how are you coming into the picture? What you are feeling cannot be felt here directly. Only thing it can feel is, so sense is your reaction, maybe verbal reaction. If you scream or if you shout and say, it's hurtful. So that's the only sensor that is there. So that's the two different things, but there are two different controllers, but primary controller again is the one who is doing the cleaning. So that's another situation. Now that's another example, which is like a mechanical example with the familiar mechanical oscillator, mass spring damper system. We are all familiar with that. Now this is our transfer function of that, right? Uh, of that mass spring damp system, the second order system. Input is the force, this force. Output is the displacement, y. Okay. So this way we know it's an open loop system. No feedback control, okay? Whatever you do here will result in this depending on your plant, which is that. There's no correction based on this output. But you can look at this same system in a different way. We know, people who have done basic controls knows that the same system can be represented like this. What is the difference? This is now a feedback system. You sense the output, which is the response, through the spring. So the spring now functions as a sensor, which senses Y. And also it kind of senses the force because the spring converts the displacement into force. Okay, so you have a feedback control system. Now the plant is this. Plant becomes mass and the damper is the plant. Spring is the controller, if you like feedback control device or the sensor in this case. Or we can also look at the same system like this. There are two feedback parts. You have the spring, you also have the damper. Now the damper functions as the speed sensor, speed force sensor, okay? So you have the displacement force sensors, which is a spring and the speed force sensor. They are all taken and there's some adjustment. The plant is the mass, okay? So this mass is the plant. Now I see that there are people who still are not muting themselves. Yeah, I can hear my echo. So anyhow, so depending on the scenario, plant is different and you introduce different types of sensors. Now, what kind of sensors are they? They are kind of passive sensors. They are not separate sensors we had. They are within the system. They perform sensory role, passive implicit sensory role. It's also kind of a control role. So in this scenario, you, in general, you can say that the damp and the spring does some control function on the mass. Okay, so again, you can think of uh, the plant, actuators, sensors, and controllers, okay? So I just want to say that it can be generalized. And then as I mentioned, you have not just sensors and actuators, it's not enough to learn about sensors and actuators, you have to learn about many other things, including these devices and the problem. So this is the issue here. You can think about this question. Why is it not enough to learn about a whole bunch of sensors and actuators in instrumentation? Because you need, number one, you need other things for it system to operate, other devices. Number two, they work together. They are not independent. Sensors, 
actuators and these other devices are not independent, they work together. That is where the mechatronics comes into the picture. Then also, let's look at this simple example. Okay, now that also can bring in some issues of design. Okay, here is a, like a simple system where you are positioning a mechanical device, say a mass, using a linear motor, which is the actuator. Now this here, mass and spring can be part of the system, or it may be something you introduce. But now you are familiar with this before. This mass and spring can serve as a passive <laughs> controller, passive sensor actuator and a controller, right? But then there is a separate sensor, which is this LVDT. Maybe you are familiar with LVDT, which is a displacement sensor. <coughs> this is its signal conditioning, if you like, circuitry. So this is a simple system. Now the question is, is it uh, this a design problem? Is it uh, instrumentation problem or is it both? So that is the key question. So it's an instrumentation problem. If you get some commercial devices and integrate them to here. So what are the things you can get commercial? LVDT, you can get commercial integrated. Actuator, you can get it commercially. All right. So these other things like uh, signal conditioning, A to D, D to A converters and so on, you can get commercially. So that getting them, integrating them is the, the instrumentation problem. But it is part of the overall design, part of the activity that will make this system functional in the final form. So in the domain of design, you have this instrumentation problem. However, I mentioned about the spring and a damper. This may not be part of the plant. This may be something you introduce. Then you may have to design it properly. This may be like a vibration mount that you may have to design. Or it can be a vibration mount that you can buy commercially. This can be a suspension system of the vehicle that you can actually buy commercially, or it may be something you have to actually develop from scratch. So it can become an explicit design problem as well in order to do the instrumentation. So you can see how intertwined this is, the instrumentation and design. I'm just trying to let you know. So this similarly here. So here, of course, you have this motor driving this convey, uh, unit in some plant. And here, there's this gear unit that you put in there. So these things you can get commercially. So you can instrument the system with these devices. And then this thing, usually you have to design, you know, properly for the particular application. So you can separate the design activity in the beginning with the instrumentation activity, but together everything is part of the design process. Okay. So then I'll also give you another example just to kind of, uh, you know, make it a little bit less boring. This is a herring roll grading machine that we develop. Now this machine can grade Herring row. I don't know how many of you know what herring row is. It's the egg sac of the fish herring. And uh, some people don't like it. They throw it away. But in Canada, in British Columbia, it's a huge like a revenue earner. We export this primarily to Japan. So Japanese love herring row, but they don't just not go only for the taste. They also consider the color, texture, size, all those things are important. And so we have to grade them carefully. Why? Because I think next slide will tell you why, but essentially if you misgrade it, it's a huge economic loss. And then other problem is this, these people who grade the manual labor force and the industry is seasonal. So you have this herring 
season where you get these people into the plant and then do the grading. But then next year, most of them may have other jobs. You have to get a new force and train them. So the company thought it's better to automate this. So the result was this machine. So this machine basically sends several things like shape, size, color, texture. That's what the, uh, the customer wants. And then we do some kind of sense of fusion to and decision making to come up with the grade. And that is the essence of this machine. Okay, let's look at the operation of the machine. I'm going to show this video clip now. Hopefully you can hear it. A prototype has been developed by us in collaboration with BC Packers Limited and Brico Incorporated for machine grading a pairing row. Manual grading that is common in industry today can easily lead to misgrading with significant economic consequences. Grade 2 row sells for about half the price of grade 1 row. Incorporation of grade 2 row in a grade 1 batch may result in gross downgrading of that batch. We have developed sensor technology for determining size, shape, color, weight, and texture for a skein of row. This information is fused in an intelligent decision-making module to arrive at a grade for the row. Okay, in the interest of the interest of time, I'm going to stop there. And I guess you can still see my PowerPoint. Now, but the questions are what are the sensors and actuators there? What are the hardware? That is, those are relevant for instrumentation problem. So you can see right away. You have sensors, you need sensors for size, shape, color, and texture. So size, shape, and color primarily can be done with your typical optical camera. When you talk about texture, it is more difficult how you feel, we introduce ultrasonic sensor for that. But the question is, are, those the, are they the best sensors? So what are the other options that are available? And then what are the actuators? Of course, the conveyor needs an actuator and the ejectors need actuators. Conveyor is run by an induction motor, like as I mentioned. Ejectors are pneumatic ejectors, but we have other options. What is the best option? Those are questions we need to ask in the instrumentation problem and also the mechatronic problem as we see. Then applications, there are many application areas. I'm not going to go into details of these. You can think about a car, for example, many things you can sense. You can, I have grouped them into different categories. You, if you can sense all these things, you can operate the car better and modern cars sense many of these things. So actuators, the same thing. There are many actuators in a car, uh, many things that you modify using actuators. Again, I have grouped them here and the modern cars do many of these things and better sensors, better actuators, uh, better integrated uh, sensors and actuators can do things better. And then you can think of other applications, not just automotive applications like some of these are mentioned here, you can extend these ideas to them as well. Then you can think about other applications like this SkyTrain in here, in Vancouver, BC. And then you can ask the question, is this a mechatronic system? So it definitely it's an electromechanical problem as well. So can we just say it's a mechanic problem? We look at this humanoid robot, Honda humanoid robot. Is it a mechatronic problem, mechatronic system? car, as I mentioned, or the hard disk drive, are these mechatronic problems. So I am saying that the mechatronic approach should include these four attributes, integrated, unified, unique, or optimal, and systematic. What do they mean? So then we come to this issue. Whatever we said before, it's electromechanical system mechatronic, system with sensors, actuators, and controls mechatronics, and so on. You can ask many questions like this. In the interest of the time, I'm going to not go into every question here. Let's get to the actual definition. 
So typically, there's some validity to those questions I asked before, but the accepted definition includes these terms, synergistic application of electromechanical things. To develop electromechanical systems or devices using an integrated design approach. So that is the accepted definition of mechatronics. Now, so you can see, I'm repeating it here, it's a synergistic application. That means you're kind of applying things together in a synergistic way, meaning one plus one is more than two, like cooperative manner, applying them in the development of electrical, electromechanical products through a process of integrated design. What is integrated? That means considering all domains together, in particular electrical and mechanical domains together. So that is the accepted definition. So we thought we should actually extend that further beyond that definition to include these all four things, okay? So not just electromechanical, it's multi-physics, include thermal, include fluid, include other domains. Because as I mentioned, many systems include other domains, not just electromechanical domains, what we know as mechatronic systems or products. Integrated, we want to keep that because it's very clear. I'm gonna have a slide justifying it further. It's clear that better if you consider all the domains together rather than them separately or sequentially in the design process. Unified, now that's a tricky term because many students thought unified means the same as integrated, but no, in our definition, our usage is a different thing. Unified here means using similar approaches or analogous approaches in all domains. Integrated means all domains considered together. Unified means using similar approaches or analogous approaches in the activities of all the domains. So that's the difference. Unique result means typically we know in our design experience, we end up with uh, different designs and then you finally pick uh, with various reasoning, one design for the application. But I'm saying, let's use some kind of optimization scheme to get the unique result or one result. So that is also a kind of a criterion or requirement in this. And the systematic, of course, I don't have to say further on that. If the steps are very clear, systematic, that's better. So that's why we say, I tell my students to know these four terms, integrated, unified, unique, and systematic. Uh, that go together with the mechatronics approach. Okay, so these are some questions you can ask yourselves to highlight some of the things we talked about. And also what are the advantages of this approach? Okay, we may touch upon some of the advantages further, but let me quickly justify some of the things. Integrated approach. So here is a, like a simple situation where integrated is better. So here we have the electrical domain represented completely separately from the mechanical domain, but the interconnection comes through this energy transformer, which can convert electrical energy to mechanical energy or mechanical energy to electrical energy. So this is, motor is uh, electric, motor is an example, which converts electrical energy to mechanical energy. Or electric generator is another example, which converts mechanical energy to electrical energy. Also, generator is also actually a sensor that senses the condition of this mechanical system. So this is also a model of an actuator or a sensor. Now, the thing to know in our integrated sense is, if I consider and design these separately, maybe you have the best electrical subsystem, best mechanical subsystem. As soon as they are connected together, they are, there's coupling, there's interaction, conditions change. They are no longer optimal, even though they were optimal before. 
So it's better to use an integrated approach, consider these together. So that's a simple justification. Now, how about a unified approach? Let's justify that too. Let's look at this simple situation where you have electric motor, then positioning this mechanical mass. It also has this hydraulic part. It could be like a shock absorber or some kind of, a, it's like a piston cylinder mechanism here. Also, you have a spring here. So essentially, this is a three domain problem. It's an electro hydro mechanical domain. Now, of course, we said considering all the domains together is good. How about the unified approach? Now, I don't want you to be panicked when I show the next slide. This is a linear graph of the system. You don't need to know the linear graph. Enough to say that this part represents the electrical subsystem. This part is the mechanical subsystem. This part is the hydraulic subsystem. Connected to this is a transformer, like the one I showed before. It's a electromechanical transformer. This is like a transformer, but it's a guy, this called a gyrator for some reason. I don't want to go in, I don't have time to go into details in that. It's like a transformer too. But the thing to remember is that I can represent it like this because I'm using a unified approach. I'm using a linear graph approach, which can represent all these domains in the same way. Okay, so clearly it's better. Not only that, I can take this, let's say my objective is to control the speed. So here's my objective, it's a mechanical objective. Actuation is electrical, okay? But I can convert this system into entirely a mechanical system, equivalent system, where I have my output the same, which is the one I want to control. By, but actuation input is now a, not a voltage source, but a velocity source. So another advantage, simpler system to control or generate, okay? So that is the second justification. All right, so now let's go to other things. Here I'm giving some advantages of the mechanical approach. Now you can think of each one separately and see why they are better, why a mechatronics approach will result in, for example, more better controllable system quickly because you are designing it better. So the control effort is less, so more controllable. Why is it more reliable? Because the chances of fault is less. Why? Because it's optimal. So you don't overload one part, whereas another part is performing beyond, below capacity. So you can kind of argue out all these things and say the mechatronics approach is good. So mechatronic instrumentation also means the same thing. That means use integrated, unified, unique, and systematic approach. That's all. In instrumentation, in the sense of selecting components and incorporating them, interconnecting and operating them together, use a unified approach. So that is the whole idea. And the procedure, I mean, this stems from the conventional instrumentation procedure. Now you, you can incorporate some mechatronic attributes here to do the product development, which may include your initial design uh, to the more detailed design. All those can take a systematic instrumentation procedure, as I mentioned here. I'm kind of skipping some of these things because time is now, I'm, I'm, I think I have only like a few minutes left. So now it should be clear why instrumentation is connected to design. And also it should be clear to you why mechatronics approach is good in, in all these activities, uh, whether we are doing the conceptual design or the detailed design, okay? All right, so examples. Let me stop with the second example and quickly uh, just three examples that we were doing in our lab. This is, this is another machine that we develop in our machine, which is a fish cutting machine. And let me show a video clip of that. Right here. 
research prototype, we developed an industrial prototype for fish cutting in collaboration with BC Packers Limited and North American Testing Company. has a very robust cutter design, and unlike the research prototype, employs hydraulic servo actuators and an intermittent motion conveyor. Okay, again, let us stop there. And you can ask some of the questions that I asked earlier for the Ering Grove grading machine. Uh, like what are the sensors? What are the actuators? What is the instrumentation problem? What is the design problem and so on? So those are relevant to our topic here today. And then let's look at this other example that we carried out in our lab. This, this has this like a water quality monitoring robots. These are like little propelling devices. You can deploy them in a body of water and they have sensors. Our design has five sensors which measure pH value, temperature, electrical conductivity, dissolved oxygen, and oxidation reduction uh, index, right? So these are relevant, not I decided, these experts who know about the quality uh, measurement uh, determine that those are enough to determine the water quality. So this device then go propel in water, take sensor readings, and then come up with the quality of the water. That way they can demarcate, for example, good areas of water and also polluted areas of water, and then transmit that information to the ground, and then the people can take action. For example, if you determine a polluted area, then authorities can quickly see where the pollution is coming from, whether it's coming from natural causes like environmental uh, situation or whether it's uh, industrial pollution or man-made like uh, fertilizer, agriculture, whatever, and then take corrective action. So that's that project. And then uh, is an instrumentation problem, design problem. Of course, these sensors you can buy off the shelf. So that becomes an, bona fide instrumentation problem. Several other things like these propellers, uh, motors you can buy. So that becomes instrumentation. But the body, how to design this, uh, the device properly so that it can propel in a stable manner, that becomes a design problem. But the whole thing is overall a design problem too. So that's what I'm getting at. So there's another situation that we are still working on. We have not completed this. It's a sleep monitoring for at home. So instead of going to a sleep clinic, which is expensive, time consuming, and also there's a long waiting list, uh, you can we do the same thing at home? Right now, they don't have commercial devices that can do comprehensive testing. So we are developing this comprehensive setup, but that needs some sensors that you cannot buy off the shelf. For example, these EEG sensors. Now people, the medical people in the audience know what EEG is. It's like essentially uh, sensing the brain signal, which is good uh, signal indicator to determine the sleep quality. So also people have determined that uh, what currently available with as wet electrodes are not suitable for this application. You have to use dry electrode EEGs. So those have to be designed new. Similarly, respiratory uh, sensing, uh, breathing sensing. Uh, the commercially available ones we find that are not particularly suitable. So developing new things like using nanotechnology, using like micro needles or polymers uh, to sense the breathing is important. Then that becomes the design problem. But then bringing these instruments sensors together becomes an instrumentation problem, which overall is a sensing problem. So that is essentially what I am trying to say. So I'll stop there. I want to thank all of you for the attention. 
I think I kind of used exactly all the time, but I am uh, here to uh, respond to any questions. If you have time, that's fine with me. I'll just uh, stop by saying what Albert Einstein said that we all are learning every day. That's all I tell my students. I learn from them, they learn from me, they learn from everybody else and so on. So we learn every day. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor De Silva. I really appreciate that. So I just want to say that it's, it's really extremely important to understand the definition of mechatronics. Because I know that uh, although we talk about it and there is a lot of mechatronic system, we still don't know the definition. So it's, it's, it's good to make the definition clear. Also the advantages, which is uh, related to optimal design. This is, this is very important. And also uh, I would like to add that this is the area that the industry needs these days. And uh, I think that's the most important area that uh, industry is looking for graduates, uh, uh, graduates who have skills in the area of mecha mechatronics area because simply everything becomes more and more mechatronics every day. So thank you very much for making that clear for us and giving us this uh, excellent, amazing talk. I really appreciate that. And thank you very much, Professor Koshnaut. I want to just point out what you said, which is excellent. I didn't say that in my talk. For example, especially for small companies, small companies, these mechatronic engineers are the more cost-effective way rather than exactly. hiring a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, they may be producing hair dryers, they may be producing this, what we call mechatronic products, but they cannot afford to hire two engineers. They can hire a mechatronic engineer. Uh, so that's a key thing. So this is a very important area that is uh, becoming popular all over the world, exactly. not only in North America, but in developing countries as well, for exactly. that reason. So it's a cost-effective solution and eventually produce a better solution, even optimal solution, which is even more advantages to have two engineers. So there are many advantages. Uh, thank you very much for clear, clearing, clear, clarifying that. So uh, I think if there is any question, if you raise hand, we can answer the questions. Uh, I think in the order, but I'm not the host anymore, so. Okay, let me, let me uh, skip the, let me actually stop sharing yeah. then and go and see whether make I can me, see the hands. You can make me host or co-host if you might make me co-host. Okay, now you have to see. Uh, next to my name. Next to your name, okay, let's Next see. to my name if you. Yeah, I'm going to now look at your name, here it is. Okay, next uh, to my picture. Yeah, I'm going to make you the host. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much, Professor De Silva. So if there's any question, we have uh, already passed the time. So <laughs> it's over one hour already. But uh, if you have a question, maybe we can answer one or two. If not, uh, as Professor De Silva said, these notes will be available. If you are interested, you can contact me and I can give you the notes. And we also will post the, the presentation, this uh, great presentation uh, on YouTube. I will post that and send you the link. Thank you very much. If you have any question, let me know. If not, thank you for attending. And, thank and also, uh, if you have any other questions, I think my email is there in my presentation. So you can email me as well. I'll be happy, happy to uh, respond offline. I think there's one hand raised, uh, Mr. Yes. Henderson. Hey, uh, do you prefer doctor or professor? Uh, anything is fine. Clara, Clara All right. is fine too. Well, hey, thanks for putting this on today. Um, I had some questions regarding uh, graduate studies. I'm actually looking at UBC of, uh, of other places. Um, which of your projects are you open to collaboration on with students, if not all of them? Okay, that's a good question. But also UBC, I think we are like one of the first people, we have undergraduate mechatronics program, which, mm -hmm. which attracts the best top mechanical engineering students. So we have, we take 30 students through interview mm -hmm. because that's so demanding. So right. we, we interview them and also we have a master of engineering mm -hmm. mechatronics program, master of engineering. So that is the entirely coursework based program, but also includes the project. 
not a thesis. Right. So that may be the option for you. But once you mm -hmm. get in there, there are numerous projects. There may be projects from various courses. For example, I teach census and actuators to mm -hmm. the same students, and there's a mini project in that. So those we can discuss and decide. And then there's another separate project requirement. You can mm -hmm. join in, you can explore who is available and join mm -hmm. in with other people in different labs and carry mm -hmm. out projects. So too numerous to mention. What you should do is, depending on your interest, you contact people and say, are you interested in this? Uh, mm -hmm. Rather than just my saying, okay, these are the things. Because right. we have a program. Uh, there are many faculty members involved in the program by teaching mm -hmm. courses and supervising projects. And whatever your interest might be, be it mm -hmm. biomedical, be it chemical, whatever, right. there may be at least one person who may be interested in doing a project with you on that. But mm -hmm. of course, the curriculum is kind of not entirely free. You mm -hmm. have like a core set of courses you have to take, plus some electives. Those you can pick. You can pick courses from electrical engineering. You can pick right. courses from computer science and so on as well as long as you satisfy the core courses. Of course, if you are interested in research, yeah. MNG is not the way. You have to go to MASC, which is the Master yeah. of Applied Science. Gotcha. There you have to do a thesis, not a project yeah. thesis. So you do bona fide research. And then with that, you can also get into PhD, if you like. Gotcha. But you cannot get directly from an MNG to a PhD. Right. Uh, typically, you have to do a MASC to get into PhD, but you are mm -hmm. like a really bright student. You come into MASC, mm -hmm. exceptional cases, we may allow you to transfer directly into the PhD. I see. Uh, without completing the master's. So that's another I, option. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Professor, the mechatronics program is just Master of Engineering, correct? Yeah. So okay. uh, the formal Mechatronics graduate program is a master of engineering program. But gotcha. that doesn't overrule, let's say you join as a master of applied science student, and then you mm -hmm. are doing some research related to mechatronics, related to design, related to instrumentation. So that is up to you and your supervisor. But the mechatronics existing master of engineering problem has some mm -hmm. a little bit more structured requirements like uh, the courses and then the project and then that project is uh, definitely has to be a mechatronics project and then there are projects in coursework as well so if i were to take uh the mechanical sorry masters of mechanical approach i could still get involved in mechatronic studies yeah because if you get into a minge Master of Engineering programming. I'm talking only about mechanical engineering now. I'm not That's talking great. about other departments. In mechanical engineering, if you enter the Master of Engineering program, mm -hmm. you are in mechatronics program. Gotcha. Uh, mechatronics in Master of Engineering. But if you enter the Master of Applied Science program, right. it's more general. But it is up okay. to you and the supervisor to kind of gear mm -hmm. it towards mechatronics. I and see. so okay. is PhD. Okay, and also if you are joining as a bachelor student, then mm -hmm. we have this undergraduate mechatronics program, which mm -hmm. we select people who apply for the mechanical engineering program, but mm -hmm. with a further interview. But we take the cream because, cream of the crop, because we typically get more than double the number of students who are qualified for mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. And so we go out of them, the people who pick mechanical engineering as the first choice. But they mm -hmm. also indicate electrical and computer engineering and so on. So we go for people who indicate mechanical as the first choice. Even mm -hmm. then you have more people than the number we can accommodate. Out of them, what we do is we pick people without interview uh, through other criteria for the mechanical engineering program. And then mm -hmm. we pick 30 people 
from that group for the mechatronics program. So that 30 people, we can be assured that they are like the top in the whole cohort. Gotcha. Okay. Well, thank you for explaining that. Um, and did you say you'd be sharing your email if we have uh, follow-up questions? Exactly. So my email is in my PowerPoint, the first page. If you look at mm -hmm. my title page in, of my presentation, it has email. It's disilva at mech.ubc.ca. It's there in the thing. And also, I'm also going to share this PowerPoint with Professor Koshnaud, so you can get a copy of that as well. But recording definitely has my email. And also Brilliant. my, uh, my uh, website. Uh, you are right. my website. Awesome. Well, I appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Sure. Okay, Nicholas, you have a question? Yeah. Nicholas? I think Nicholas has to unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, he asked his question in the chat. Oh. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, Nicholas, Nicholas is not unmuting, so it will be somebody. So he doesn't else. have a mic. Let me, uh, he doesn't have a mic, sorry. So oh, he doesn't have a mic. Okay. So how do you, what are the so he cannot ask the question. So you want to maybe send it on chat? Oh, it's in the chat. Okay. Yes, it's in the so chat. Chat say, oh, thank you. So Nicholas says, okay, thank you. Me, what are some qualities that companies might be interested in looking to hire mechatronic engineers? Okay, good. Oh, sorry, I didn't. Yeah, I should have checked the chat. Now I see. That's a very good question. What are the qualities? Now. One of the key qualities, Professor Koshinaw had mentioned that, uh, rather than hiring two different engineers, one mechanical, one electrical, maybe mechanical engineer may not have a uh, reasonable familiarity with the electrical and electronics domain and the vice versa. Now we are hiring one engineer, mechatronics engineer, who has expertise in the mechanical dynamics, mechanical things, electrical, electronic things, and how to bring these things together, develop these uh, multi-domain, multi-physics things. So what are they looking for? The attributes of a um, mechatronics engineer are most likely what they are looking for. The capabilities in all the domains, being able to uh, be practical, you know, like some design experience, having a design project, for example, you know, having a project, because when you go for the interview, you can, for example, take the project report with you, share it with the uh, company saying, I did this project, which addresses address these things. And these are the considerations, but don't worry if the company produces other things. Company may be producing vacuum cleaners and your project may be uh, in automotive industry. Doesn't matter. There are common features in all these things. The industry will value that background. And also remember, if you are a new engineer, you, their industry doesn't expect you to be an expert in everything. There will be training involved. We, you will have on the job training that will happen by interacting with other people in the company. So don't feel bad to share things, share experience in other applications, other projects, because that practical savvy you know, your practical invitation, inclination itself will be a plus thing at the interview. So thank you for clar clarifying that. So uh, I agree with you. So if once you learn a mechatronics approach, then you can adapt to other areas, different areas uh, as of uh, specific projects. So yeah, I think I agree. Yes. Exactly, and also Edwin, Edwin has a question. Yes. Uh, so you can please unmute yourself. Yeah, please ask. Hi. Hello? I, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes. good. I can see you. Oh, I can see you, but I can hear you. Yes. Uh, yeah, my camera is not good. <laughs> okay, good. Go ahead, please. Yeah. Yeah, so my question consists of uh, uh, just a general idea for the mechatronics and within our department as the electromechanical engineers at Cal Poly Pomona, yeah. we do learn most of the base, most of the 
basic concepts of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering for basics, you know, to, I guess, uh, introduce us more into the mechatronics of the industry. Um, for me, right, right now, the experience that I've been having under our department has been great since uh, I currently have an internship with the uh, Los Angeles County Department of Transportation, which I can see what the comments you and uh, the Professor Carl Haas has been saying that when they hire two engineers for what a, a, a mechatronics engineer could be doing. Uh, in the here at the traffic controls and electrical operations, they do a pump station for flood maintenance control. And the electrical engineer just basically does like how much power does the motor need in order to be operating for the pump station. And then the mechanical engineer gets involved and they spend all this much money. But um, in the mechatronics uh, field, we're able to learn more about those concepts about the motor and like energizing power into the motor and you know just the, the application of those concepts because i know when i speak with engineers on the industry here they they say that they don't really learn that stuff in school they just uh learned it on the trade through their experience they didn't really do a lot of application uh and their experience in college. But uh, well, I guess what my question is, is does the mechatronics is more application based rather than the theoretical of, uh, you know, just what we've been learning in college, I guess? Yeah, that's a very good question. The Edwin's question is a very good question. Now, what I want to say that many programs in the beginning, we also had, you know, when I, I joined our uh, university in 1988, so long time ago. And still, even at that time, we had electromechanical program, right? Uh, so many people rush to say electromechanical is mechatronics. Of course, I can say that the electromechanical is the foundation for mechatronics. But as we saw, as I try to explain, you have to bring in this integrated, unified, optimal and systematic approach to make it mechatronics. So you can say on the one hand, electromechanical is also practical, but mechatronics is better practical because you can say uh, traditionally, I think your example is very good from motor sizing, actuator sizing, picking the actuator for the application. So you can treat the actuator separately, uh, the load separately, and somehow try to match the two together. But better way is to consider both together, match the characteristics of the actuator with the characteristics of the load under variable conditions. So that is the mechatronic approach, the best match of the two things, whereas in the electromechanical traditional approach, you may match, but it may not be the best match. There is no even guarantee that it will operate properly. It may end up overloading the motor. It may end up overloading some hardware. Whereas if you use the mechatronics approach, you kind of inherently guarantee that is the best optimal design. So it will not create those problems. It will have best match. It will not lead to uh, like, you know, undesirable conditions. And that also why I said it's more reliable, you know, less prone to uh, faults, malfunctions, and more efficient and so on. But it's a good point. Okay. And then for, um, say, uh, like, Tying into that question for graduate program for mechatronics, uh, as uh, rising engineers uh, from a bachelor's degree, we were supposed to be considering to take the FE exam for the EIT, the engineering and training exam. Do, for us, electromechanical engineers and trying to get into a mechatronics program, 
do we take the mechanical engineering exam or do we should we take the electrical or just the general engineering exam for the fundamental so uh, i don't know because our engineering training program in bc may be different from what you have in california but essentially i think it's up to you but i think it eventually will depend on your pe registration i don't think there's a category of mechatronics engineer uh, in pe i think this either mechanical or electrical right now so you may have to decide on one or the other i think maybe professor koshnau can elaborate further i know from bc point of view here we can either for example i am registered as a mechanical engineer i have a ph from mechanical engineering not in electrical engineering even though i have expertise in the mechatronics area. so uh, thank you professor de silva yes i also would like to add to what you just said that uh, uh, so the expectation for the students sometimes they expect that uh, so when you finish your uh, undergraduate study there's so many things you have to learn so first thing is that uh, there's no enough time to go to too much specific for every single different project that you may face in industry so then so you get more general knowledge you can decide or choose a project related to that specific future project that you would like to do in industry and choose that as your project senior design project and work on that and learn more in detail more in hands on that's what you can do another thing that i would like to also add that is so what you do in the as it's like when you're an undergraduate one of the most important thing is you learn how to learn so it's not that you learn exactly what you need in future you learn how to learn in future if you need to do a different project okay yeah yeah that's a good point thank you thank you so looks like we have exhausted the questions yes <laughs> thank you very much anyhow, i think you ran out of said, time my or... email is there if you have other thank questions so send me an email and go from there and i want to thank all of you thank professor mm -hmm. kushnar for thank you organizing so much. this very important activity and i appreciate it thank that. you i really i'm really grateful for your valuable time and this very important talk which is mechatronics is one of the most important talks or field in engineering for both industry and research and really i appreciate that in terms of explaining it and the benefits thank you so much thank you, thank you. bye thank you. bye thank you.